Welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for attending today's McEwen Celebrates Month of Scholarship presentation. My name is Joanne Meineker. I'm Associate Dean Academic in the Faculty of Arts and Science, and I'm pleased to be your moderator for the event. I would like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which we gather in Treaty 6 territory is the traditional gathering place for many Indigenous people. We honour and respect the history, languages, ceremonies and culture of the First Nations, Métis and Inuit who call this territory home. The First Peoples' connection to the land teaches us about our inherent responsibility to protect and respect Mother Earth. And with this acknowledgement, we honour the ancestors and children who were buried here, missing and murdered Indigenous women and men, and the process of ongoing collective healing for all human beings. We are reminded that we are all treaty people and of the responsibility we have to one another. Today, we are joined by Dr. Shelley Boulian for a presentation called, Is Canada Resilient to Misinformation? Dr. Shelley Boulian is an Associate Professor in Sociology at McEwen University. She conducts research on media use and public opinion as well as civic and political engagement using meta-analysis techniques, experiments, and surveys. Her research on digital social media is well cited with more than 3,000 citations according to Google Scholar. Dr. Boulian has won the best paper awards for both the American Political Science Association and the American Sociological Association. In addition, 2019 to 2021, Dr. Boulian was one of McEwen's Board of Governors Research Chairs. Before I turn our attention over to Shelley, I'd like to let you know that I hope you'll have questions for her. I'd ask that you put them in the Q&A, not the chat, but the Q&A. It's at the bottom of the right side of your screen, and please direct them to all co-hosts. I'll address them during the Q&A at the end of the presentation, and Dr. Boulian will be answering them. So without further ado, welcome, Dr. Boulian. Great. Thank you very much for that introduction. I just want to remind people again that this uh, presentation will be recorded, but we will turn off the recording when it time comes time for the question and answer period. So thank you very much for that introduction. Um, let's start with the slides. There we go. Can you see everything? Everybody's on mute. Yeah, good. Okay, I see. <laughs> I see Joanne. So we're ready to go. Is Canada resilient to misinformation? So I want to begin with some thank yous. I want to thank the funders and I want to thank my report co-authors. There's a link to the report. It's posted on Rome, the McEwen online repository. Um, I also want to thank my colleagues who offered advice on this project, and I have them listed there. Uh, in addition to those colleagues, I have a whole plan about outreach activities, and I'm going to involve even more colleagues in that process. So thank you to everybody there. I'm not going to try to summarize the entire report. It's 50 some pages and there are 20 graphs and hundreds of numbers. Um, what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to go back to the research grant that I wrote in August 2020 and then provide some insights onto um, what I've learned from that. So I'm going to begin with misinformation and def the definition of the problem or the definition of misinformation, the problem and why it matters. I'm going to get into the idea of resilience and the framework for resilience. I'm going to go through my research methodology, which is survey data from 2019 and 2021. Um, and I'm going to tell you about my findings. So in short, my findings are that Canadians are similar to Americans in terms of level of exposure to misinformation. Canadians are less likely to share misinformation and Canadians are less likely to counter misinformation. So I'll elaborate on those three findings. In conclusion, uh, high levels of social media use have left Canada vulnerable to misinformation despite our public broadcasting system and despite our trust in national news media. And then I end on the point that Canadians need to be more active in countering misinformation in correcting and reporting uh, processes. 
So misinformation is widely understood as a claim that contradicts or distorts common understandings of verifiable facts. So this definition focuses on the content of the claim rather than the intent of its author or propagator. So this definition is in contrast to disinformation, which is false information that is intended to cause harm. So for example, discouraging people from voting. There are debates about whether misinformation is a real issue or if it's an exaggerated concern. In particular, some argue that, that while misinformation is out there, people rarely see it and don't believe it, so it's not really a problem. On the other hand, some argue that if people are concerned about the issue, that makes it a real issue. Furthermore, if people think a post is misinformation, then act accordingly, then misinformation becomes real in its consequences. So other research has found that citizens are indeed concerned about misinformation, and other research has documented cross-national differences in self-excess exposure to misinformation. So I will just stop for just one minute. Apparently my slides are on autopilot uh, moving forward without my intervention, which is probably good because then I won't spend terribly too much time on any single slide. So the problem of misinformation or fake news was identified in the 2016 election, as well as in the Brexit referendum, and that it continued to be a concern through the elections in the United Kingdom in 2017 and 2019, the elections in France in 2017, and then the recent Canadian election in 2019, and of course, in 2020 as well for the US election. Now the pandemic hit and the world was faced with an onslaught of misinformation about COVID-19. In the case of the pandemic, misinformation really is a matter of life or death. We might make the same argument about misinformation around the U.S. election since four people died uh, when the U.S. Capitol building was attacked on January 6th. But misinformation can undermine faith in key democratic processes and disrupt public health efforts to manage the COVID pandemic. So Humprick has defined resilience in terms of the collective capacity to sustain one's well-being in the face of challenges. In the context of disinformation, which is what they're studying, they outline a series of societal level conditions that would increase resilience to disinformation. So their work builds on Benkler's work on disinformation, but they offer a much more robust model about understanding cross-national differences. They define resilience as a structural context in which disinformation does not reach a large number of citizens, and when it does reach citizens, people will be less inclined to support or further distribute such information. And in some cases, they will be more likely to counter that information. So while they focused on exposure, I think that there's a variety of activities that we need to consider as part of resilience. So exposure, sharing information, and the activities that constitute countering misinformation. So this is a summary of their uh, resilience framework. So they talk about the political environment and how that differs cross-nationally and affects whether or not countries are resilient to misinformation. So in the US, they have a strong polarization of their population. In part, that's fed by how their electoral system works. But the idea is that a countries with higher degrees of political polarizations will be less likely to distinguish between false and correct information and decrease their resilience to disinformation. So populism builds on that idea about casting differences and polarizing the public. Populism uses this framing of us versus them, and that's going to polarize people further. It's also a part of populism to breed mistrust in elites and to discredit expert knowledge, including scientists, and of course, to attack the news media, which is Trump's version of populism. So populism is connected to conspiracy theories that the elites are working against the public interest. And this type of communication is expected to increase exposure and decrease resilience to disinformation. In terms of the media environment, the idea here is if there's a distrust in the news media, 
people will go to a variety of media sources and that will lead to a fragmented media audience. So what happens in this context is people may end up on fake news websites. They may or may not realize that they're fake news websites, but what happens is they're increased in their exposure to misinformation and of course, decreased resilience to disinformation. In contrast, if people trust the news media, then they'll use the new media, the mainstream news media, and this will build resilience. So another element to the media environment is looking at the public service media. So in that kind of context, when societies have a public service media, it's expected to increase the quality of journalistic content as the media companies are competing for audiences. So that drives competition, a competition towards quality news sources. So having a media ecosystem that includes a public service broadcaster is expected to increase resilience. In terms of the economic side, well, there's a profit to be made with fake news and disinformation campaigns. The profit is made from directing people to these fake news websites. Uh, going to these fake news websites where advertisers are basically paying for eyeballs. So you can see in this context that there is a economic value to, to posting very sensationalized fake news stories. All of this will amount to less resilience to disinformation. And then finally, social media is included in economic environment. I'm not sure why, but that is the, the outline that they have provided. And the argument there is social media is a tool that can provide opportunities to amplify disinformation. So when it's circulating on social media, people are gonna recirculate it, um, and then that will expand uh, exposure to misinformation. And then, of course, social media has other problems attached to it, which is concerns about echo chambers of like-minded partisans, which feeds back into the political environment. So social media use is expected to decrease resilience. So in Canada, uh, I expect that Canadians should have greater resilience compared to the other countries that are in my study. So in terms of populist communications, we do have a populist party. They weren't elected. The leader wasn't elected. Um, and at this particular moment in time, we do have rather weak populist movement in Canada. In terms of societal polarization, we do have our polarizing issues, but they're not addressed in the same way as they are in the United States, where this polarization is leading to riots. So in Canada, there is greater trust in the news media. We do have a public service broadcasting system, and these are expected to build resilience to disinformation. We are, in fact, a small media market. So people who are in the business of trying to get advertisers, they have less economic incentives to post fake news stories because there's just not a lot of Canadians to consume that type of news. And then finally, in terms of social media use, we are intense users of social media, and this will, will uh, impact our resilience. It'll decrease our resilience to misinformation. So one of the concerns I have with this model and adapting it to Canada is that we need to consider the fact that Canadians consume a lot of American media, which exposes us to a country that is one of the worst in the world for disinformation and misinformation. So we have that exposure to that highly polarized and populist discourse because we're consuming so much American media. So in terms of looking at these factors, I'm not going to test the entire model. A lot of these are societal uh, characteristics, and so they're not easily transported into a survey. And I, I'm presenting survey research here. Um, so the factors that I'm going to focus on are trust in news media, and social media news consumption. Those are also factors that Humprick et al. had found as significant predictors when they did their 18 country study uh, around disinformation. So they've already validated that these are actually the two most important factors to consider. I retain the use of public service media in my model because I'm curious as to how this plays out, both in Canada as well as in the other countries where they have these public service media. So getting into the methodology, I have some key independent variables from my survey. 
So I have trust in national news media to act in the best interest of the public. I have use of public service media. So in all of the countries, I asked about use of BBC because I'd done prior surveys and actually BBC is pretty popular across these different countries. Um, in France, I asked about French television and in Canada, we asked about the CBC and Radio Canada. So in terms of social media use, the measure I'm using here is whoops, following a news organization on a social media platform. So any platform, do you follow a news organization? And of course, our critical variable um, is country. So understanding these cross-national differences in terms of misinformation. So our dependent variables are misinformation exposure, we talk about sharing misinformation, and then I have three activities to consider as part of countering misinformation. So the report actually has more uh, activities to counter misinformation, but I focused on these three for this presentation. So uh, we use survey data from 2019. Again, that was with SHRC funding. And then in February 2021 with Canadian Heritage Funding, we, we surveyed those countries again to have updated and more nuance in our data around misinformation. So Cantar administered the survey in both cases. They administered the survey to adults over the age of 18 in those various countries. And the way that the online panel works is I give them these quotas that they have to reach in each of the uh, different uh, age categories and sex, and they have to match up those quotas so that we represent what the population is in each country. So part one, I will focus on this issue of exposure to misinformation. And then part two will be the spreading and part three is about countering. So true or false, the new coronavirus contains toxic ingredients that are more dangerous than getting uh, COVID-19. So as a pop quiz, you're gonna send your answers to Dr. Joanne Meineker and she's gonna grade them for me. So what do you think, is this true or false? Well, thank you. Great. I'm you guys are great. False. False. <laughs> That's false. Great. false. Awesome. Fill it with negativity because these are false. These are misinformation as identified by AFP Fact Checked, which is a France organization on fact checking. So great. I'm glad that you guys know this information about the vaccines. So measuring exposure to misinformation is difficult. So we use this measure. I've got the screenshot right there. Uh, we used this measure in 2019 and we decided to keep it in 2021. This whole field of research has been changing quite rapidly um, in the past few years and it was hard to you know, figure out how we're going to measure this. What we did differently though in 2021 is we wanted to make sure that people understood misinformation the way we intended it to be. We want it as information that is false, okay? So we followed up with some questions about their source of misinformation, the topic of misinformation, their confidence in their ability to identify misinformation, and their awareness of eight false stories. So those two examples from the previous slide are part of the stories that we asked people about. So we didn't ask about true or false. We just asked them if they were aware of these stories. So again, repeating this idea or validating the idea that they were in fact exposed to misinformation. So exposure to misinformation on social media increased from 58% of respondents in the 2019 survey to 70% of respondents in the 2021 survey. So in both the 2021 survey and the 2019 survey, we see a consistent pattern where the US and Canada have high levels of exposure to misinformation and the UK and France have lower levels of exposure. And this was also found in an IPSO survey. So across these three different sources, we see a consistent pattern around cross-national differences. So moving beyond the report, and again, it's uh, available on Rome, um, moving beyond that, I wanted to provide some multivariate analysis to try to understand the many factors that might influence exposure to misinformation. So of course I have those three 
uh, to consider that are part of the resilience framework. So the trust, public service, media and social media use, as well as country. Those are core to that framework. I also included statistical controls around age, gender, education and ideology, because ideology is a really hot topic when we're talking about misin misinformation. So here what I found is that while the resilience framework expected a negative relationship between trust and exposure, it's actually a positive relationship. The resilience framework also suggests that use of public service media or the presence of a public broadcasting system would negatively influence exposure. But in the survey results, we found that it was in fact positive. Now, social media news consumption operates exactly how we would expect it to operate. The more you, or the people who are more likely to follow news organizations on social media, they report greater exposure or more likely to report exposure to social media. In terms of country differences, all of these countries are compared to the United States. So that negative sign there says that the UK has lower levels of exposure compared to the United States. France as well, lower levels of exposure compared to the United States. And then Canada is expected to be more resilient, but we find that there is in fact no significant difference between Canada and the US. So I presented it in the bivariate in the previous graph. And here I'm telling you that this relationship um, holds true when we have a number of factors that we've accounted for. So based on the resilience framework, we expect Canada to be more resilient than the United States, but our exposure is similar, okay? And again, I explain this in part because we're exposed to US media and American news sources. We're getting all of that polarized populist discourse into our media diets, and this is what the re one of the reasons. Social media is also, of course, the other reason that we see this. But what's important here in terms of the resilience framework is it doesn't operate the way we expect. Okay, we expected that trust in news media and public service media consumption would increase resilience and decrease exposure, but that's not what we're finding. So sharing misinformation. So you're possibly aware of this uh, misinformation around Donald Trump and his tweets throughout his presidency and into the elections. Um, so he tweeted this on November 7th. Uh, I won this election by a, by a lot. And Twitter attached this warning to this message saying official services may have uh, may not have called the race when this was tweeted. But what I wanted to draw your attention to here is the number of retweets and quotes um, of that misinformation. So he post something and people are recirculating and we're getting that. So even if you don't follow Donald Trump on Twitter, you can't do it now because he's uh, been deplatformed. But even if you don't follow him directly, you would see these messages because people are recirculating this message. So Facebook, that's the one on the left. Facebook um, has this automated feature where if you're posting about vaccines or at least in this particular case, posting about the vaccine, uh, prompted an automated response where Facebook is telling you, look, go to the World Health Organization. These act vaccines are tested for safety and effectiveness. So this is what I'm talking about here is this idea of sharing misinformation and the role of social media in that aspect. So there's many studies on the topic of sharing misinformation, and they have come up with estimates between 10% and 25% of citizens will uh, engage in sharing of misinformation. So the exact estimates, of course, are going to vary by country, by year of data collection, as well as how it's measured. So is it measured in terms of a survey? Is it measured by looking at people's digital trace data to see if they, in fact, clicked share on a particular post? So we asked respondents to consider all of the information they shared on social media then asked if they even by accident shared misinformation. And so across all of these countries, we see that 18% of people admitted to sharing misinformation. So the U.S. is high. The U.S. is high in terms of the incident rate, and the United Kingdom is low. So again, getting into the multivariate model here, we expected based on the resilience framework 
that uh, if you trust news media and you used public service media, you would be less likely to share misinformation. Again, the theory doesn't find support with our data. When we ran the numbers, we saw that it's actually a positive relationship. Social media use for news consumption works the way that we thought. You follow a news organization on social media, you're more likely to share misinformation. So here we find for the country level results, we see that the US is exceptional. The US is distinctive in being more frequent in terms of sharing misinformation. So Americans share misinformation more so than all those other countries. So this is in fact a good news story around Canada. Um, even though we're exposed to a lot of information, we're not sharing it. So that's good, that's good news. So as expected from the resilience framework, Canada is resilient to misinformation if we measure it in this one particular way. So if we're measuring sharing of misinformation, then Canadians do perform the way that we expected. However, again, we see that this resilience framework didn't work as we expected, especially around the trust and the use of public service broadcasting. Social media, of course, is operating the way we expected. Uh, the more you use, or if you uh, follow news organizations, you're more likely to share misinformation. So the last part of my presentation is around countering misinformation. So there's three activities that I'm gonna consider. One of them is checking uh, the information against other sources, and then we will look at reporting it to social media platforms. <laughs> and then correcting each other's social media posts. So of those who were exposed to misinformation, so this is a subsample, we see that 52% of respondents um, checked or verified misinformation against other sources. And this is consistent with research that Statistics Canada has put out as well, but they were focused on the COVID um, uh, pandemic. So information in, in relation to that. So Canadians are checking uh, their sources when they see misinformation they are checking it against other sources or at least half of them are in terms of correcting others who post misinformation canadians don't do this very often for the entire sample so all of the respondents in all those four countries it's 27 percent and the uk and canada are distinctive here in being low in terms of correcting others okay the US, uh, they like to correct others. In France, they like to correct others as well. So I'm going to show you this idea of reporting misinformation to social media sites. I'm gonna let Kelsey, she's got a video here. She's gonna show you how to do it. So this is reporting misinformation on Facebook. All right, so it took her 13 seconds to do this. And I wanna encourage you to consider that when you see misinformation posted on Facebook, to consider reporting it to uh, Facebook. So report it to the platform moderators so they can address it. So of those who were exposed to misinformation, only 20% of respondents thought to do that, thought to go ahead and report it to the social media platforms. Now, some platforms make it very easy to report misinformation and other platforms don't even have a category for misinformation and they make it much more difficult to try to report on uh, false information. So here's our multivariate model and it's got those three activities that I mentioned. So checking against other sources, correcting others misinformation and reporting it to the platforms. So the results are consistent across those three activities. If you trust the news media, then you're more likely to check, correct, and report. This is a good news story. This is what the resilience framework expected to happen. So when we want to talk about the value of the resilience framework, it really is a value around countering misinformation. So the more you trust news media, the more likely you're going to counter misinformation. The more you use public service media, it's also linked to a greater likelihood of checking, correcting, and reporting misinformation. Now, this time it's social media that isn't operating the way that the framework suggests. So the framework is pretty much one sided in saying, look, social media is bad. It's contributing in a bad way to misinformation. But in this particular case, we see that social media news consumption 
is positively related to checking, correcting, and reporting misinformation. So that's a good news story, but not exactly how the framework had uh, set up the expectations. So in terms of Canada, we also see this consistent pattern that Canada is less likely, Canadians are less likely to check, correct, and report misinformation. All right, that is the first sentence on this slide. So summarizing part three, Canadians are less likely to check, correct, and report misinformation compared to Americans, which decreases their resilience to misinformation. And again, we see that the theory or the framework around resiliency didn't work the way that we had it expected, but it's this time it's the social media uh, dimension that didn't work as expected. So summary and conclusions. Whoop. Okay, so the resilience framework does require some modifications. As we observed, um, some relationships did not follow the way they expected. And I would say there's two big changes that need to be made. One, we need to consider countries that have higher levels of exposure to US media. We need to factor this into the model. And I think that that will help us understand why Canadians have higher levels of exposure. The other thing uh, that we need to consider is social media platform differences and look at that aspect, especially on the countering of misinformation. So building that into the model. So what about Canada? So compared to the United States, Canada is not more resilient to misinformation. Canadians have similar rates of exposure to misinformation, and I explain this as in terms of our consumption of American media, exposing us to their very highly polarized and populist political environment and their fragmented media ecosystem. So Canadians' media diets are filled with this American content, which means exposure to one of the worst countries in the world for misinformation. And it also doesn't help that Canadians have high levels of social media use that leaves us with high levels of exposure and less resilience to misinformation. So a few weeks ago, Bridgman et al. Has published a study that perfectly illustrates the arguments that I'm making about the relationship between Canadians and US media sources. They study Canadian Twitter accounts and Canadian survey data to show that, and I'm quoting here, the majority of misinformation circulating on Twitter is retweeted from US-based accounts. Moreover, exposure to US-based media outlets is associated with COVID-19 misperceptions. Increased exposure to US-based information on Twitter is associated with increased likelihood to post misinformation. So in sum, high levels of social media use have left Canada vulnerable to misinformation, despite our public broadcasting system and our trust in national news media. So in terms of countering misinformation, Canadians don't engage in this activity. And I would explain that in terms of Canadians being too polite, just like the results we saw with the British respondents, where they don't like to correct other people when they post misinformation. So my solution would be to encourage Canadians to report misinformation to social media platforms, which allows us to counter the misinformation without introducing that conflict or incivility that comes with correcting other people. Some would argue that we need to have people correcting other people's uh, misinformation posts. However, I question whether this would res resonate well with Canadians. I know that it wouldn't work very well for females. I have prior research on gender and political communication. Females don't like to correct other people. And in this particular study, if you go back to those results, you see that actually females are less likely to correct others when they post misinformation. So I don't think that is necessarily going to work for Canadians as a Canadian solution to the misinformation. I think there'd be much stronger possibilities by working with the social media platforms. So as I mentioned before, these different platforms have different affordances that encourage or discourage the reporting of misinformation. So we want Canadians to report it um, and we have to build capacity or their skills to do that kind of reporting and work with platforms to make it easier to do so. We don't want to leave misinformation unchecked 
As mentioned, misinformation in our current context has life or death implications, particularly in relation to the COVID-19 vaccine. Thank you. Thank you, Shelley, for that compelling presentation of expert information rather than misinformation. So we already have a, a question in uh, the q and I'm going to read it out and ask you to respond. This person says, great presentation. I disagree that in Canada, there is no populist appetite or demand <laughs> for populism. Here, the electoral system plays a huge disincentivizing role to limit the populist vote. Is that it? <laughs> Okay, I, I was careful when I read that statement because at different points in time, Canada has had a strong populist movement. So if we think of a, the reform party as being part of that populist movement, we certainly um, see that pattern and it was a, a strong movement. Um, but at this particular time, and if we compare it to the US, the UK and France, we're actually weak on the populist dimension. So uh, if you're interested, uh, in the research on populism in these other three countries, I have published a study on that particular topic. It was cited in a, in a New York Times piece. Um, and basically, the argument is that the populist strain is really strong in these other countries. So comparatively, Canada is actually quite weak. So whether it's not really that Canada has no populism, it's that compared to these other countries at this particular point in time, it is rather a weak movement. Thank you. So I'd encourage uh, attendees to use the Q&A response here. Um, it's weak because populist demand is still there. Do you want me to keep going on that one? <laughs> if you want to comment more, and I would encourage, encourage uh, other people to jump on board and ask their questions. I've got another one here, so maybe I'll answer that or I'll let you answer that. <laughs> Thanks for your talk, Shelley. Is there always a clear line between what is fact and what is fiction? How does this play into your study results? Oh dear, that is a good question. Um, so the definition that we have is one where it is information that can be verified as as true or false. So that's the definition that Guess and Leon have put out there. And I wish I could build that into a survey question. The problem is that people don't know what is and is not a verifiable fact. So what we're expecting in our survey, what we're testing with our false news stories, with all of this is building this idea that we're sticking to things to, that are not ideas that you disagree with but things that can absolutely absolutely be proven to be false. So we relied on these fact-checking websites to identify these stories for us. And on those fact-checking websites, and I'm thinking of PolitiFact, um, they have a, a scale to determine, you know, basically how wrong the information is and they pro for provide the data or the results to show that it is in fact wrong. But it is a really hard thing to do. Um, and I'm not gonna, yeah. You know, there's ideological issues about what's true and what's false. Thanks. We have a bunch more. I'll go to the next one. How can we encourage social media outlets to have accountability? Oh, that's great. Um, so we could probably try something that Australia tried to do. Not sure that that was effective. But I think actually what we need to do is we need to work with other countries to try to force uh, social media companies to be accountable. And I think that the US government is our primary ally in this respect. We have statistics that are consistent with what is observed in the American context. So we have similar sets of issues to deal with. So they're our ally in this respect. I do think that you know Australia could be an ally and there's other countries as well that are trying to do something uh, to uh, hold social media platforms accountable. I will say too that I'm presenting this research to the US State Department. So if I can in some way encourage uh, those governments to work together and hold social media uh, companies accountable, that would be great. 
But again, it has to be some sort of joint effort to keep them accountable. Thank you. Next question is, my question is more so about the effects of getting rid of misinformation by reporting it all. How would that impact individuals being able to spot misinformation from real information? So that's a good question. One of the things that I glossed over is around the ideologies and how people on the right have a different reaction to misinformation than people who are moderate or on the left. What we see with people who are on the right is we see them being more likely to report it to social media platforms, and we see them more likely to correct others. And to me, this is a problem because then we're not getting corrections on both sides. We're correcting only um, to discredit, I guess, at the left, um, where that's not going to be an effective strategy. So um, I, I understand your question and what that means, uh, but I think that our bigger issue is the issue of only the right side, people who identify on the right side being in the role of correcting and reporting misinformation. Thank you. As conspiracy theories is a huge part of the spread of misinformation, with the leap to the mainstream of these conspiracies and the mainstream media reporting on them now, how could this focus from mainstream media affect the landscape of misinformation? So, so that's great. Again, I'm just tapping into this data. So it was collected in February 2021. One of the topics we do cover is we ask survey questions about conspiracy beliefs and conspiracy theories. The idea that elites are working together um, and against the public interest. So we have the data about that. We also have data on populism, on populist attitudes. So going back to the first person who was posing that question, I mean, we could run these numbers to see if Canadians score lower on populist attitudes uh, compared to those other countries. But I think the framework was, was really about whether or not the populist communication is being put out there by political elites. So all of these are great topics to sort of follow up on and to elaborate on this paper. But again, I just had a few weeks to prepare this presentation. I have not even begun to look into all of the different uh, variables that I have in this data set. Good time to tell you I'm getting thank yous and great response from people who have asked their questions. From results from more media and news trust, oh, sorry, from results, does more media and news trust also increase questioning those sources or just other sources? You know, I was surprised by how those findings played out, in particular because that's not how it worked out when it was tested in the 18 country survey that I had mentioned. So I think that we need more nuance in there. And I would actually say we need another data source to kind of look at what the reaction is to misinformation and why there could be a relationship. So if we're consuming traditional media or mainstream media and they're covering these fake news stories, of course that would increase exposure and explain that positive relationship. But the problem is that my data also shows that following those new sources and trusting them means you're sharing misinformation. So there's a lot of nuances that need to be teased out there. Um, and again, I think another data source might be better to try to a qualitative data source, or at least another data source of some form to try to get at what's happening there because it is puzzling. Do you think these findings are a warning of sorts that political players could take advantage of Canada's high social media use to expand the spread of misinformation? They go on, if it's mostly retweeting of US-based accounts, perhaps that won't stay the same. So there is research coming out of Oxford, Oxford that was looking at whether or not Canada has been targeted with disinformation campaigns. I couldn't tell you off the top of my head where Canada stands in terms of the risks and whether people have tried to take advantage of our high levels of social media use to, you know, introduce bots and, you know, demobilize voters and do that sort of thing. I don't know that line of research. I just know that it's out there and it is, a, I guess, a possibility. I don't know that it, whether or not it has been done or not done. That's fair. Where can we direct people for fact checking 
and what can we say to people to encourage them to be responsible consumers of information? I love that question. So I have many answers to that question. One of them is that we should be going to the World Health Organization um, to try to check information about COVID. I do have that survey question in my sur survey, so I can factor that into that, but that seems specific to COVID. I also look at local news or local health agencies and whether people are following those online to get their information. So I have a lot, a lot of sources that I've asked about and where people are getting their information and whether or not that helps build the capacity to counter information. So on that particular topic, it seems like we have a credible organization to go to. The problem is on the political side, right? Um, and there are fact checking organizations and they're credited and um, they work together internationally. There are those organizations, yet those organizations still come under scrutiny from uh, right wing commentators that they're biased in some ways. So we need something that is a credible source to talk about political issues and to fact check political issues, something that may be more uh, resilient to attacks from right wing commentators. Okay, the next person says, thank you for your presentation, very informative. I wonder if you deal with self-selection issues, especially a respondent may self-select as exposed to misinformation because there is too much talk about this all over the media. Um, so when I was preparing the questionnaire, I had lots of advice from people all over the globe who are studying this issue. It is not easy to use a survey to try to measure uh, misinformation exposure, but I actually think it's great. I think it's worth, it's good to collaborate with people or talk to people who don't believe that this is an issue because they know the arguments of how to discredit this. So the idea that we could use that single measure about self-assessed exposure and leave it as a valid measure. I mean, we didn't have that in 2021. We had lots of follow-up questions. This idea of scrutinizing that claim that you were in fact exposed. So we asked them about the source. So for example, if they were saying the source of their misinformation was government, then we had some skepticism that they were really um, reporting on misinformation as opposed to information they simply disagreed with. Uh, because in these four countries, democratic countries, they rate pretty highly in terms of the quality of a government and government information. So we had that follow up, follow up question. Instead, people were saying they were getting their misinformation from people they didn't know. Okay. We had about what the topic was. So again, COVID came up as a popular topic. Um, we had lots of follow-up questions that were basically saying, look, you said you were exposed, but were you really? I wanna know more details about what you were exposed to. We even had an open box where people could type in what they were exposed to, and they would just tell us stories about what they were exposed to. Very, very nuanced stuff about particular stories. So, um, I hope that answers the question, maybe too long uh, of an answer to that particular question. Thank you. So this is the last one I have on my queue. So if anyone wants to uh, provide any more questions for Dr. Bullion, please do so. What we have is, do you know the association between those who listen to misinformation and believe in conspiracy theories and those who have experienced trauma or barrier in um, I don't. I know that there's research that looks at. So we borrowed that that question about awareness of fake news stories. We borrowed that from research done by Valenzuela and colleagues. And so they had actually built a framework in to say, are you aware of this story? Do you believe this story? And then so on and so forth. So we had borrowed that. Now, in the context of some sort of disaster or sorry, I can't remember the word used to characterize that. Are people more likely to believe fake news? Is that the question? I'll repeat it one more time. Do you know the association between those who listen to misinformation, believe in conspiracies, and those who've been ex who have experienced traumas and barriers in mainstream society? I see. So is there some groups that are more vulnerable to believing misinformation? Um, yes, because of their vulnerabilities in society or traumatic experiences. Um, Yes, I can't 
uh, tell you specifically what study to point you towards that. Um, I think Dana Gal, what is her last name? She is working on uh, that particular topic, uh, but I don't know if there's a citation out there yet. Maybe this person could email me and I will track down my sources um, and give you some information about that. But I, I can send you the Valenzuela study um, and as well as this American scholar who has done some work on that. Okay, offline we can we can do that definitely. And the person says, thanks for all your answers so far. Okay, after watching the US presidential debates, how could fact checking be quicker? Once news is out, it's hard to get what is said back in the box. Uh, that is a good question. I would say that I'm not the best person to answer that particular question. I know that there's a whole line of research on fact checking websites and people doing fact checking. We're doing fact checking during the debates and posting on on Twitter. I mean, the problem with this this quick validity check or uh, quick false true false uh, checks is that we're also less inclined to believe them. I mean, it's as easy to spit out a lie as it is to, you know, try to correct that lie and come up with a different lie. And so I think that, you know, the debates have this problem built into them where people want, people can say, and the candidates can say whatever they want um, and people believe it. But the process of debunking those lies takes a long time. If you want to do it properly, it does take a long time to do so. All right, and I have thank you for your presentation, Shelley, and for your answer. Nothing more in the Q&A right now, but maybe I'll ask you a pretty broad question. You have done um, an enormous amount of research and, and using surveys in many different uh, kinds of research questions. Is there anything that stands out to you that um, was a lesson you, you learned in this particular project? Not so much about the content, but the, the research process. Um. I don't know that there was anything. I do know that this particular project was a challenge to do because we received notice about funding on December 17th and we executed the entire project, including this report by March 31st. So that is an incredible timeline. On the Shirk project, in contrast, we had done uh, the entire project in six months and I had collaborators to help me with the project and they thought that this was entirely too intense of a process to try to do in six months so it's definitely a lesson learned in terms of what could be done in a small period of time and so that was something i mean it could be done that's that's what i learned through this process it could be done of course are we going to go insane possibly but i did have some great uh, help along the way i mean i had great responsive help when I had to do translations or we got the translations, we had to proofread translations. So I have some supports in there. And of course, uh, I have a team that would review each version of the questionnaire that was programmed to make sure that everything was perfect. So we had lots of resources to make everything happen in three months. It's just, um, yeah, that was a challenge. So that power of the collaboration really, yes. really came together, yeah. Okay, I've got another one. How can we hold filtration of information companies accountable for the information that we're shown or receiving on social media? I know you can essentially filter a feed to never see another opinion sort of thing. For example, the ads that you see, the accounts that show up. So I would actually question whether you can do that. I, I have uh, subscriptions to all of these different uh, social media and I just presented um, some stuff about Facebook and we talked about Twitter, but we actually ask about a lot of social media platforms. I think it's like 14. Anyways, I am trying to understand whether or not we can build these echo chambers and get a tailored messaging within each of these systems. Now, Facebook is the most sophisticated because we're supposed to be able to choose what kind of interests are tagged to us. We're supposed to be able to mute 
uh, people who we don't want to see it. We're supposed to be able to respond to comments, co uh, particular posts and say whether or not we want to see more or less of this. But I've actually done lots of experimentation trying to tailor my Facebook feed into an echo chambers like news feed. And it does not work. It does not work. And I have done that with the other social media platforms as well. Um, so trying to see what happens on Reddit when you read Reddit, can you tailor it so you only see things that you agree with and you want to see? So, for example, um, on TikTok, I only want to see about dogs. OK, I want to see if that, in fact, can be held true. Am I just going to see dogs when I go on TikTok? Because that's all I want to see. So it is, in fact, in practice, really hard to get that algorithm to put you in some sort of echo chambers and to uh, tailor your content on social media based on your particular interests. That's fascinating. I tried to say no more cats, but they keep showing me cats as well. I mean, just to give you an idea, people are doing this on the political level. I'm trying to do this with dogs and cats. I want to see dogs and I don't want to see cats. No offense to cat people. <laughs> No more okay, questions. We are approaching the hour. We are approaching the hour, and I don't see anything more in the Q and A chat. So I'll turn it back to you, Shelley. And if you want to lead us out and uh, close close the presentation, I just want to say another round of thank yous. I know I had that list right at the beginning of the presentation. I don't know if people joined um, the presentation late, but I do have to thank Kelsey Friesen. Um, as well as Stephanie Bellan, who were working full time on this project throughout this entire process. And so they got me on the weekends and they got me in the evenings. That's the time that I had to work on this project, but they carried it through and they were wonderful through this whole process. And of course, I have um, six other research assistants who were there to support this entire process. So I'm very um, grateful that I had all of this support in place to do the project. So thank you to them as our last concluding note.